went back to Harvard as a junior faculty, uh, sorry, as a junior fellow with the Harvard Society of Fellows. Um, can you hear me? Is it on? Uh, Professor Kachru then um, held the uh, research position at Rutgers University and became a faculty member at um, Berkeley in the, early, in the late 90s. And then he moved to Stanford uh, for a faculty position. Uh, Professor Kachru has many awards and honors. He is um, well known for finding, for example, the first uh, the first models of the cosmological constant within string theory. He um, he won the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship among his awards and the ACIPA Outstanding Young Physicist Prize in 2008. And um, Professor Kachru um, has discovered many connections between string theory and condensed matter physics and cosmology, especially um, in regards to the study of the extra dimensions in string theory. And uh, today he will tell us about the physics and mathematics of the moonshine, please. All right, thanks for the introduction. It's always a, a pleasure to be here at Berkeley. And um, I won't start by mentioning the, uh, the outcome of the big game. <laughs> so, um, Right, I'm talking about a subject that, that, that may seem unconventional. Probably most of you, even, even those of you who are senior faculty, have never heard a physics colloquium about moonshine. Uh, the moonshine that's intended here is not the kind that would lead you to believe that there will be free alcohol samples in the talk. So you're out of luck. That's why you came. And in fact, a lot of the talk will be extremely introductory, just explaining what moonshine is, what are the objects that it relates, and why it's interesting. Um, to the extent that I'll say anything new, it's based on material that was taught to me by some um, treasured collaborators, some mathematicians, Miranda Chang, who's either in Amsterdam or Cambridge, John Duncan, who's actually moved from Case now, and Sarah Harrison, who is my student and is now at Harvard, and then a bunch of postdocs and students at Stanford who keep teaching me new things uh, about related ideas. OK, so again, this is an unfamiliar subject, and it involves maybe three sets of unfamiliar objects, so I want to keep the big picture in mind. The talk will be elementary. I promise you'll understand it. But before I give an outline, let me tell you what the big picture is going to be. Uh, in the center, we'll have string theory, because I'm a string theorist. But on the sides, we'll have three different very beautiful classes of objects, all of which really rate their own entire classes. Uh, on the one hand, we have group theory, the study of symmetries. Here's a picture of the root lattice of one of the most beautiful groups, E8. On another hand, we have something called modular forms, which arise in the study of number theory. And I don't expect that you know what these are, and I'll give a very brief physical introduction. Uh, and on yet a third hand, if you have three hands, uh, we have algebraic geometry, which is the abstract study of certain kinds of shapes and surfaces, which arise in string theory because the theory, for better or worse, has extra dimensions. So we'll talk about mysterious relations between these three a priori totally distinct areas of mathematics. And the, the way string theory enters is, in fact, it mediates these relationships. They were discovered in part in string theory or proved through the use. Of string theory. So moonshine is really just the name for the subject that relates all of these classes of objects. And the way they're related is special backgrounds of string theory, some solution of the equations of motion of string theory, relates all the classes of objects and provides the unifying structure. An important point about this talk, as opposed to many colloquia, is that there will be no triumphant punchline at the end. We know the relations are there. I'll pre present some of the evidence, and it's overwhelming evidence, but we don't know why. So the talk's introductory. I'll start with a very elementary discu discussion of symmetries and groups. Then I'll give a string theory primer. So this is the 10-minute version of Polchinski's two volumes. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take you in, in the study of moonshine to about the mid-1990s, when the first case was understood. And in fact, a lot of the best work on this was done here in Berkeley. Uh, and then I'll tell, tell you about why I'm giving this talk today, about uh, a reincarnation of this subject, a reinvigoration that's really taken place in the last four or five years. OK, so, so symmetries are a familiar object to any physicist. They're an important ingredient in nature at many scales and in many subfields of physics. Uh, as children, you might, if you ever look at snowflake flakes up close, remark on the symmetries of a snowflake. Uh, in condensed matter physics, you might encounter 
uh, the lattice symmetries of solids, which were classified crystalline symmetries. Uh, here we have an emergent symmetry of some sort of, uh, I don't know, triangular lattice and a vortex lattice that emerges in a superconductor. And of course, in particle physics, you know, there's this, um, the particle physicist analog of the periodic table with quarks, leptons, force carriers, the photon and the weak force carriers, uh, and now the Higgs particle, which was discovered at great expense to the taxpayers. Um, but this, this table for a real particle physicist, we don't really need to remember the name so much as some group theory that underlies it, some symmetric structure. Now, it's important to distinguish between two different cases, at least philosophically. Uh, with vortex lattices, for instance, and type 2 superconductors, of which I showed a picture here. I stole this from Seamus Davis's webpage at Cornell. Uh, the symmetric structure is emergent. You start at high temperatures, you lower the temperature in some regime of B field and temperature. Vortices will form, and they spontaneously form a, a symmetric lattice, which minimizes the free energy. But in other cases, uh, the symmetries that we guess actually help us in what we think of as the basic formulation of the theory. Okay, so in high energy theory, which is where I grew up, the hope has always been not so much that there are just emergent symmetries, though that might be the case, but also that there are basic symmetries of the theory, and that the most fundamental way to understand the theory will be to first state what the symmetries are, and then th those will dictate the rest of the theory. That philosophy might be wrong. These, are, these views of emergence versus fundamental symmetries are in some conflict, and it's not clear which one will turn out to be deeper. But in any case, there have been great examples in, in recent years. Uh, the low energy world, shown in this picture, for particle physicists, you know, it's not so symmetric. These particles have various masses and coupling constant. The forces are not unified in any way. But it looks a little more symmetric when you take into account the Higgs mechanism. So the, the postulate is that there was uh, a fundamental Higgs field, at least as far as we can tell. In the early universe, it sat at the top of this potential hill. Symmetries were restored between some of the existing forces. And it's only at low temperatures and at late times that the symmetries break to the even less symmetric structure we see today. Uh, another example where we hope symmetries will emerge eventually in the study of particle physics it's been a paradigm that's guided the field for 30 years that we don't know if it's true, uh, isn't the idea of grand unification. So we have uh, the strong nuclear force, which binds the quarks. We have the electromagnetic force, the most familiar in everyday life. We have the, the weak nuclear force, which leads to beta decay, alpha emission. And, you know, they look pretty disparate in their strengths. Hence, one is called strong and one is called weak. But, in fact, the strength of these forces change with the energy scale at which you probe them. Okay, so the electromagnetic coupling constant, alpha, we all learn in freshman electromagnetism, it's 1 over 137. But if you go down the street from my office to Slack, where they sat on the Z-pole and produced many Z-particles in 1990, they were sitting at, you know, the right energy to produce a Z-pair, a Z so 180 GeV in the center of mass. And the effective electromagnetic coupling measured there in very precise data is more like 1 over 128. The coupling changes with the effective energy of the process in which it in which it's appearing. And so the couplings change effectively with energy, and there's some hope that they may unify at a high energy scale, giving rise, giving rise to an emergent symmetry that unifies the forces. Now, I'm not going to talk about that. That's an old subject. It's a great subject, but it's not my subject today. So an ambitious question that we would need to answer a priori to really understand the full set of possible physical theories is can we classify all possible symmetries that might occur in a physical system and then stratify the space of possibilities by symmetry and maybe understand the most symmetric systems first? Now, that's stated in layman's terms. The word symmetry is a little too imprecise. So I'm going to abstract the question a bit. Let's consider a simple example of symmetries. Take an equilateral triangle with vertices A, B, and C. What do we mean by symmetries? We mean by operations that we could imagine doing to this triangle that would take it back to itself and let's restrict ourselves to the plane. So one thing we could do is rotate it by six, sorry, you know, through 120, 240, or 360 degrees, leaving it in place. Another thing we could do is, is flip it across one of these axes. Here, for instance, exchanging B and C while leaving A fixed. So these are all operations we could do. And because they're symmetries, if we do one and then another, we'll still get back the same triangle. So you can compose them in a natural way. 
So if you now label each option, rotate by 120 degrees, rotate by 240 degrees, flip across the axis bisecting A and, and the, the BC line, if you label these by abstract symbols, which represent elements of a mathematical object called a group, you could just work out how the symmetries compose once and for all. If you first rotate, then flip, here's what you did to the triangle. And the result is a sort of boring analog of the multiplication table. Okay, here it is. There are six symmetries of the triangle, including the identity do nothing to the triangle. And this is what happens if you first rotate by 120 degrees uh, and then do a flip on the line that goes through the B vertex. So that abstract object represented very concretely in a multiplication table with certain properties is called a group. More formally, groups are sets of operations like this that can be combined or multiplied. The identity element that does nothing is always in the group. Uh, every element in a group has an inverse. If you rotate one way, you could rotate back the other way. If you rotate to the right, you could rotate to the left. And multiplication is associative. Now, symmetries of physical systems, it turns out, correspond to groups. They're groups of transformations that weave the system invariant. And you've all seen this. This is quite basic for some of you. Some of you might not have used this language before. But familiar examples are the rotation groups of space. You know, we think space is symmetric under rotations if we weren't sitting in this room, but we're in vacuum in outer space. Uh, translation groups, say in crystals, uh, crystallographic groups, right. Now, the reason that this is a useful notion is that when we have a symmetry, the system preserves some symmetry, maybe a discrete symmetry like a lattice, then the excitations of the system, the, the low energy particles, are well classified by how they transform under the symmetry, how they break the symmetry if they're present. And again, just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is very familiar when you first take quantum mechanics. The first example of a new quantum number that was discovered is the spin quantum number. And this tells us how particles behave under spatial rotations. So we happen to live in three plus one dimensions as far as we can tell. So the rotation group is an SU2. Uh, the electron is spin a half. It can be up or down along, say, the z-axis. That's a doublet representation of SU2. But more generally, you could take systems of many electrons and add their angular momenta and get spin j representations of SU2. Okay. So the spin governs the dimension of the representation of the group, the number of different states that transform into each other under rotations. Spin j means there's two j plus one states. For j equals a half, you get the familiar up and down of the electron. Okay, again, um, that's a very prosaic example. There are much fancier examples. A standard hope from my youth was that still hidden symmetries of nature might end up unifying this sort of increasingly messy picture into just one big rotationally symmetric multiplet of a big enough group. Okay, it so happens that if you add up all the particles here in the right way, the number 16 appears and suggests it's a single group SO10. That's an old idea, it hasn't yet borne fruit, but we can hope that it will. So anyway, the study of these symmetries has played an important role in both particle and condensed matter physics. So anyway, can we classify the possible groups and see if they're interesting examples that might play well with other areas of physics? Okay, there are obviously at least two different questions here, two different kinds of beasts, because there are two kinds of groups. There are the ones that have continuous parameters like rotations. You could rotate through one degree or pi degrees. But then there are also finite groups, like the symmetries of the triangle, which have just discrete operations. So here's a continuous group of rotations, um, but the symmetries of the triangle are some other kind of beast. And I'm going to be concerned with the finite symmetry groups today. So the ones with some finite discrete set of operations. Now, the reason this is a good subject to talk about now, but would have been harder to talk about 30 years ago, is that today, really as of the mid-1980s, and increasingly uh, in a way that's, that's parsable by humans, the finite groups have been classified. Very roughly, all of the finite groups are built out of certain atoms of symmetry, which are called the simple finite groups. And the way you should think of this at the level of precision for a colloquium is that you know, all, all integers are products of primes. There's a unique prime factorization. Similarly, all the finite groups are in some sense